three, two, one. Action. Hey, how do I say your name so I say it right? Oh, it's uh, Hamza. Hamza, got yeah. it. And Micah is mine, so. Oh, is it Micah? Uh, sorry, I was, I was going for Micah, sorry. <laughs> no, you're good. Yeah, that's why, you know, it's always good to ask. Yeah. So uh, Hamza. Yeah, Hamza. Uh, how, so, yeah, just how's everything been, man, obviously, since Evil's come out? I mean, just, by the way, congratulations on that, because I thought it was very, very good. Oh, thank you. Thank you, man. Yeah, it's been good. It's been... Uh, it's been fun to kind of see how people have received it and, you know, just to be able to uh, enjoy it through a new lens, you know, sometimes when you're in a project and you're just nonstop working on it, you kind of lose sight of, is this good? Do people like it? Is it, is it going to be good? You know, whatever, because yeah. you've seen it 10 billion times. So it's been fun to kind of see the response from people now and, and um, kind of see it through yeah and it must also be different because obviously when you're doing a series you've got eight different episodes so you're probably seeing it more than say it just an individual oh film. yeah man and it was crazy too because we did all eight episodes in like less than six months oh wow and yeah so it was like go you know <laughs> and so you imagine researching it shooting it doing all the stuff within that time for editing it so it was like you know, go, 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 and nonstop. And so for me, I'm like looking at this cut, you know, for a couple hours and looking at that cut for a couple hours. And we're just going back and back. And, you know, so your brain gets a little scrambled up. Like, what are we talking about now? Got yeah. it. You know, so it's cool. Well, is this the Mrs. story? Is this Hulk Hogan story? It's like, I can imagine that. Yeah, the... man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Especially, you know, for me, it was, um, you know, I didn't have a huge, it wasn't like I was a super fan. I it was familiar with all of these guys, but I wasn't like one of these people who has been following it like very, very closely for, you know, a decade, you know, so to be able to jump into something that is uh, exploring the depths of psychology was even for me just bringing myself up to speed, not only on their linear timeline of their career, but also just the wrestling world in general you're asking us to do something deeper than what anybody's done on a speed yeah. rush you know and so you're kind of like whoa what are we talking about and that's where <laughs> you know people like the wwe were able to kind of help and we brought on some consultants and some different people because um that's always helpful just hey tell me quickly when i have a question here instead of me having to go dig into the library and come out with all a stack of things you know yeah yeah so yeah, I was, that was actually going to be my first question because I'm always curious, like, um, I, as I said to you my, in my initial email, the thing I like to focus on now is, like, the blend of wrestling and film. So when, when the films, in, like, this case, is made about wrestling or wrestlers star in films, etc. Um, so I've seen a lot, um, uh, of course, but I'm always curious to see when people behind these projects, like, are they fans? Are they not fans? Like, so it's always interesting to see that perspective. Yeah. So would you would you class yourself as being a fan in any capacity like in in previous or would you say you were you were aware of I mean, it more I, than anything I, you know i would say i was a fan in the in the terms of like i played all the video games i knew all of the you know i'd play like yeah. n64 but it was more of like middle school high school yeah you know and then i just kind of casually would keep up with the guys that i knew from that era you know, so the the Hollywood Hogan's and Undertaker and stuff like that. But as far as being a fan, I would I would say that's not really a fan if you kind of lose touch for a number of years. Mm. You know, and so for me, um, uh, but but what I think was why they brought me in was because you know when I when I did the thirty for thirty Chuck and Tito, mm. I wasn't really a fan of the UFC. You know, and so for me, it was about um, how do you tell a story from a POV that's not gonna be so inside baseball that the general public wouldn't like it, but then you can kind of blend those two worlds. And so I think me not being having any kind of attachment to it was able for me to step back and really go, okay, well, how do I make something that everybody can enjoy? You know, and so like what's entertaining for, to me, 
in this world would probably be entertaining to somebody who's getting exposure from it for the first time. So that's kind of what my brand has been is be drop into this crazy world or subculture, try to make diehards like it and appreciate it, but also have the general fan who knows nothing about it, you know, be entertained by it too. Yeah. I mean, and you definitely did. I mean, like I, I would say I'm a diehard for sure, like on the wrestling side and like I, I, I appreciated the, I guess the casual blend, if you will, of it. And that's, yeah. that was one of the Thanks, things I was going to, I was going to ask you about uh, in a little bit as well. Yeah. That's a question I had. Yeah. And we can get started whenever you want. I don't want to like steal any of your material and I'm, you know, I've done these so I can, I can rehash some of those same answers if you ask me to. So we'd be in good shape. No worries, no worries. Um, uh, but what, one of the things I want to start with, like how, how did this actually come to you? Like how did this project actually fall in your lap? And like, did they have it all kind of pre-planned out? Like this is what we want to do, do it? Or was it, this is, this is a vague idea of what this is and kind of let's go from there. Yeah, so basically how it worked is John Cena came up with the idea of, you know, kind of exploring the evil character characters and the psychology behind it and how they kind of interacted with pop culture and it was basically a log line at that point and then um they wwe and peacock came to Buna murray which is a big production company that does Ms. and misses and a bunch of other things they have strong ufc ties and they said hey we want to bring in a 30 for 30 director or somebody who's done long form that can make this a premium documentary series that can help us kind of crack the code on how to take this log line into something that's can be a series that has multiple seasons and you know does that and so at that point i was brought in we started you know kind of trying to figure out the format started trying to figure out um you know how we would tell these stories and who the characters were going to be what we were going to do to make them feel different so it wasn't just the same you know, thing over and over and over. We understood that people were going to watch, you know, the Sasha Banks episode, and then they may watch the Hollywood Hogan. There may be some crossover on some things that you cover, but we wanted it to be that everyone is a little bit different from the next. And so we set some parameters up on like, you know, what is this series going to do that other series that currently exist within the WWE universe don't do? So the difficult thing was to make a distinction between the biography series on a and e that they're doing yeah. and ours you know and so some information we could talk about and some information we couldn't so one of the rules that we set up for example was i said okay well if we're talking about the psychology of the character we need to think about these being method actors you know or method performers and so the only biographical information we're going to give them is something that directly relates back to their character and so if we're going to go into the into that, we need to be able to see that come through in their evil persona. And so those are some rules that we started to put on it and it got tricky, but then eventually we were like, okay, how do we balance that? You know, and as all WWE projects that make it difficult, it's always hard because are you telling the story of the character? Are you talking the story about the performer? And so one of the things that we wanted to make an intentional choice on was when you talk about Terry Balea, you talk about Terry, you say Terry, you even title him Terry, you even title Mark, Mark, instead of The Undertaker, which yeah. hadn't really been done before, but we had to separate those two a little bit in order to really understand the psychology behind it in a different way than had been done before. Yeah. And I think, I mean, that honestly, that definitely comes through. I think some episodes more than others because like some right. i can only imagine it's very difficult to keep that balance throughout the duration of an hour right. or however long it was yeah yeah but no and i could is the for doing that but how, how did you come to the like inclusion did they have the eight subjects lined out originally of these are who were this is who we're going to do it on or did, was that also a talking point of who should we do it on um yeah, we, I mean, there was numerous conversations and there's like so many things whenever you're balancing with celebrity talent is like, you're like, okay, well, can we get them? Okay, well, who else do we get? How do they fit within the landscape of this? We want to mix some people with old people, you know, some legends with some current people, um, female competitors, you know, there's a lot of different things that go at play, you know, and so ultimately, um, you know, ultimately WWE 
you know, it kind of figures out who they want and okay. who we can get in that rush timeline too, you know? And so um, that was kind of what it is. And then you also want to balance, um, you know, if you're trying to do multiple seasons of this, you, you don't want to do every, all the best, you know, classic people in season one, you know? So yeah. I think the goal is for them to do multiple seasons, you know, just like any series. So if you, uh, if you do that, then you kind of want to spread those out too. Yeah. I mean, you do come out with some, pretty big like heavy hitters like if we're talking wrestling history hogan oh, no Blair. i mean even today you got roman sasha that's like two of even yeah. there's randy premier guys like across the board so i mean that's quite a stuck like home run like a uh, team if you will like straight straight away yeah i yeah, you know and what was interesting for me too is that you know from my perspective because i was just more familiar with the classic guys the legendary people it was interesting for me to start getting into the Roman Reigns in the Sasha Banks. And then on the other side of it to see the way that the fans have responded, because in my brain, you know, I'm like, Oh, well, these people are like the Mount Rushmore of this. And then when you start to see Sasha Banks and Roman Reigns getting so much, you know, in, in the Miz getting so much, you know, push, you're kind of like, Oh, Whoa. Like I had no idea in some ways that, it would be that they were at that level, you know? And so you're kind of like, whoa, this is, it, it just puts everything in this perspective of how times are changing and how huge this universe and the fandom in it is. Yeah. Cause even like, I think Roman says it at the beginning of the episode, he's like quite ruthlessly, but maybe truthfully what worked Hulk Hogan doesn't work in 2022. He's like, right. I work in 2022. Like this is, it, it evolves. It, right. it, you know, it changes. So I guess even for you, that's like, Oh, like, you can see the evolution, if you will. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's it was really a, a fun project to work on, especially from that, because all the things that you think you know, and all the stories, frankly, that you think that you know, um, when you start hearing things through the different POVs, and that's one of the challenges of many of doing documentaries that someone can tell you a story, the other person tells you the story, and the truth is somewhere in the middle. Exactly. You know what I mean? And so you're always kind of like, ah, how do you find the balance there? You know, for sure. I think so. I think I read somewhere that documentaries are versions of truth. It's obviously you never maybe get the specific accurate 100% truth. Yeah, it's, 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 that's, that's probably 100% accurate. Yeah. Um, what was John Cena like to work with? Obviously, he was the producer, the creator, um, and obviously the narrator as well. Uh, what, was, what was that experience like to work with John? Because John's, I guess, a brilliant bridge as well if we're talking pop culture wwe because he's obviously making his name in hollywood here but he's also kingpin of wwe as well so it's perfect i would imagine perfect middleman yeah you know he was he was awesome i mean one you know i had never met him before you know starting to go through this and one the idea um the concept was genius and so mm -hmm. i think that it's very clear to his heart you know and so he had kind of um you know, the fact that he was willing to come up with the idea and then get WWE on board to kind of peel back the curtain. I think that says a lot about his influence and a lot about like how much he's in tune with the WWE universe and what people would want. Um, and then, you know, for us, it was, it was really just a couple conversations about, Hey, this is what he's looking for. And then he was very hands off as far as letting me be able to go and execute it. And, um, you know, he just said, Hey, I, you know, I just, I trust you to go do it. And I know that uh, you're a quality filmmaker and I don't want to be in the way. And so, you know, in a lot of ways, that's what you can, uh, that's what you always hope for in a good leader. And that's what yeah. you hope for from a good executive producer. And, you know, he was able to do that. And uh, hopefully we, well, it sounds like, uh, you know, we delivered on that, um, that expectation. And so uh, I'm really proud of it. I mean, I think also it's a genius move for him to narrate it. It's such a, like, I don't know, juxta juxtaposition, if you will, like the ultimate good guy no who's narrating the series of the the, the biggest villains uh, in the WWE history. Yeah, no, I mean, it is. And, you know, I think that that's his voice. Um, you know, it was really it was really cool because um, what I, one of the things I appreciated about, about John, his sensibilities, is that when we talked about, well, how do we want to use you as a narrator? And he said, you know, because there was some back and forth, you know, sometimes the network is like, well, you got John Cena. Does he need to be a character? Like, is he playing John Cena, the wrestler? Is it narrated through like a, 
you know, would it be the type of thing where he comes in and he says, you know, he beat everybody. Well, not everybody. Uh, you know, it's like they wanted to, you know, there was a lot of discussion about like, are we still putting John over, even though he's the narrator? And, you know, John was like, no, I do not want to distract from the story that we are telling. Pretend and write it as if I am just someone else. I could be Morgan Freeman. I could be anyone else. You know, it's just my voice. And so I think that that was a great um, note and it really spoke to me because I was like, thank God, you know, that, cause it would, you know, it could, it could get into this like self-promotion mode and he didn't want that. And I think it speaks a lot to his um, intelligence um, that, you know, I, I mean, I think there's a lot of people that realize how, what a great performer he is and what a great um, uh, obviously, but when you talk to a storyteller that just gets it on the other side of things, um, it's just really refreshing. And so I think that that was one of the notes that he made that was that was really impactful. Yeah, he, he definitely seems like he comes across that way as well. So it's always cool to hear that he definitely, I mean, what we see is almost what we get as well in your experiences. Yeah, and you know, a lot of these celebrities, and I've worked with a bunch of them, a lot of them can be very hands-on and like screw up stuff. And because they just have, they want to like, they have, so much pride they want to put their fingerprints on everything yeah it's so much ego and you know and, and and john was not that way at all you know john was very much like hey you know this is the idea and this is what i want out of it and i trust you to go execute it and then it was like i mean he didn't give any crazy notes he didn't do anything you know other than that it was just like this is what it is and luckily we you know we struck and we did it and it struck a chord with him and um, you know, everybody was, you know, popping bottles. So that was <laughs> what it was. Yeah, no, it, no, it, it definitely works. And, and I think one of the things you highlight there with, with John's, like you talk about the idea of them making the, it, making it potentially corny with, with John being John as the narrator and maybe as almost a right. character. And I think that was maybe, I'm gonna be honest with you, my reservations going into this. Because uh, sometimes you can get those generic, should we say fluff pieces maybe in, in, in this kind no of doubt. thing where it's like where it's watered down or whatnot. So I love the concept. I love the idea of exploring villains and just the characters. But I had my fear of maybe it's going to be more generic and maybe in in a way what, what potentially could have yeah. been. Um, but obviously it's I mean, not. Listen, and, it's and I had the same, I had the same reservations. You know, I mean, when I took the gig, it was the same reservations. You know, it was sort of like, all right, how can we, are we really going to be able to do it and not have it feel like, you know, this, this uh, propaganda piece for whatever person we're doing, you know what I mean? And so, cause that's kind of what a lot of stuff has been in the past. Yeah. And so I think that um, I think to WWE's credit and to Peacock's credit and to Buna Murray's credit, they all were like, this has to be different. And if we're going to do something premium, we're going to bring in premium filmmakers, premium editors, premium cinematographers, and we're going to peel back all of those boundaries and try to do something different than what we've done in the past. There's a place for that stuff, but there's a place for this too. And I, and I really, really um, can't speak highly enough about the people that we were able to collaborate with because they, they really um, understood that and wanted it to be different. Yeah. And, and peel back, you do, because it's, it's, they're so, like, the, one of the things I was really pleasantly surprised about is it's so layered, like each episode, um, certain episodes more than others, for sure. But I like, they're so layered and there's, there's such relatable themes. And I, and I think for me, like, I, I, I don't know if this is the case for you when you're making it, but each episode seems to almost be driven by like a certain theme, like with Miz's story, it's respect, him striving for respect. Like that's the draw seems like the driving force, you know, with uh, like uh, brandies, it's almost like finding himself within this maniacal character and or who's the brandy or and the person who's the, who's the villain. Um, but that's so relatable. That's kind of like such a, has an impact. And the, the, is, was that like something that happened organically or was that a conscious thing on your mind that like these themes are almost like guiding the stories? Yeah. Well, first off, thank you for saying that because as a director, it makes you feel so good that it lands with somebody, you know? So for me, I'm like, oh man, thank God. Um, but that is, that was something that was intentional because, you know, for me, um, when you do a project, 
there's a version of the project that is like um, the Wikipedia version of the project, right? And that's like the easy story, the easy spine, where you're like, they're a kid, then they get into wrestling, then they do this, and then they do that, and then they have this trial, and then like, that's like the easiest part, right? Yeah. But the hardest part is to get people to connect with it. And for me, it's about what do you really have to say it has to be some sort of a theme that all people can relate to. And ideally your character, you know, grows in that, that theme. And so it's those themes for me that tend to bring out the human side, even if it is a ton of wrestling, like in the flair episode, it's just yeah. like, it's wall to wall wrestling, you know, it's just like, you know, but you, but the themes are kind of what give you the heart to a lot of it. And um, as a filmmaker, when you're doing a project and you're looking at something, you know, 200 times, it's those themes. If you can't find something that resonates with you, then you're going to be burnt out. And so for me, I like to find something that makes it feel more important. Like there's something to say rather than this guy became a wrestler, then he got super famous because that to me is trivial. And if you do trivial stuff, eventually as a creative, you're kind of like, ah, you just want to punch yourself in the head. And there's those projects that happen and those are commerce projects. And you just hope that you can do some art projects and you can find some projects that have meaning. And so that's in this series, you know, one of the things we wanted to do is to find what are we trying to say with each of these? Was it refreshing for you to almost like unpick this? Like when you obviously, because especially with the current guys like Miz, Randy, Sasha, Roman, who you might have not been very familiar with, to kind of find that deep rooted layer behind their stories with like Roman, it's like this, he always knew he was going to be something, but it's just art, it's just arduous journey to get there and all this obstacles, health, fan criticism, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, man. Like, was it incredible? Almost, amazing for you to discover it is and you know what's what's um you know not to get like too artsy on it but you think about like um and i and, and to a certain degree i think it's kind of crap you know but like you know you think about these method actors and how they have to like get into their character it's similar you know uh, as a director like you have to explore yourself in different ways to be able to get into the headspace of your characters and you have to be able to get into a place where you can empathize with them and understand whatever their trial was. And in some cases, if they don't have those types of um, struggles or trials, you, it's your job to almost become sort of like a therapist and help them discover those deeper meanings through an interview or about themselves. And so I think that that's kind of an art form in itself to be able to help people put these pieces together when you step back as a third party and look at their life. And then you kind of can bring it to them and be like, hmm, did this blah, 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 blah. And they're like, whoa, I never really thought about it. Because sometimes you live over here in the here and now and you don't really have a chance to step back. And so that's the fun part for me is to be able to not only explore internally, like what's really stood out to me about this, but then also to kind of look at somebody's story in a big picture sense and be like, what does this say about them internally, externally, like the world around it? How did all these context things, whether from their childhood or from the world around them, got them to the place that they're at? You know, so if you're looking at um, The Undertaker, you're looking at um, the satanic panic, you know, what is a role that was like stuff in the eighties maybe played in, you know, people be buying into this and him getting so famous, you know? So we ended up not putting too much of that stuff in there, but you know, it's, it's one of those contextual things of like, why does somebody get so famous at this time? Why are people like so into this? And it's because of the world around it in context always makes stories stronger. Yeah. I mean, that's, and that is something I, I loved. I love that aspect. Like the use of, like you said, the world around it, especially at the time periods, like we're talking like 
80s Cold War and the impact and that had on why Hulk Hogan was even more of a like importance to the world and why he had such a fandom why you know right. 80s was the era of capitalism that's why Flair was the perfect heel for the 80s and stuff like I never even thought of I was just like oh like but I was like that oh that really I know it but it adds such a greater significance to what they did when they did it and it's like right and also with those guys with Flair and Hogan I mean I've seen countless documentaries videos interviews of those guys so th- that for me was particularly I was like oh what's gonna be new here like oh, what can they tell me that I don't already know almost in, the, in, the, in this regard but it wasn't so much the content was new it was the way you did it and I think that the use of pop culture and stuff I thought in particular was was brilliant and I thought especially with the Flair documentary I said it in my review it's like you parallel Flair story with that of like a mafia movie gone like Scott yeah, right. and that's Flair's yeah. story it's it's him being so him t- the journey to the power him being so immersed in it not being able to see where he's going what's going and then the fall and then right. even then obviously then when we look at how we look at characters like Scarface now we love them because of how embroiled right. they were how committed they were and that's Flair and I was like that's yeah. so true and it's so fascinating but you just don't think about it but you putting that together was so refreshing yeah, man. And it's and it's tricky, you know, and some episodes are easier than others. And obviously, like some episodes um, like Hogan's uh, has all the layers that you would want because you have, you know, his personal life going. Then you have the conflict with the WCW. Then you have like, you know, the context of the world around him, which is, you know, networks battling and the the war stuff and all of those. So sometimes you have stories that have that stuff organically come into play. And some of them haven't happened yet. You know, Roman hasn't really had that type of thing, you know, and in some ways, um, some ways flair even is one beat you know, when you're trying to figure out what that is all about, because, you know, he's kind of the same guy as his character, you know, and so um, there's a lot of moving parts to a lot of them, but I'm glad that uh, we were able to kind of filter them out and figure out where it goes. Where. Yeah, because that's another reason why I look at, especially some of those episodes, and I could like show some of my friends who are not fans, but like that intro with Flair, and you have those like little snippets of iconic 80s villains, and then you show like Scarface, things like that, and then we go back to the origin story of Flair and get to his journey. But they were constantly paralleling it with like like that eighties movie Mafia Don. It's like one yeah. another reason why I could show like a friend of mine to be like, just sit down, and watch this, and they could connect. And they, it's just oh, one, yeah, one, cool. one other step to be like, oh yeah, I can I can watch this, I can enjoy this, and it can you can be a wrestling fan, or you don't have to be a wrestling fan. Uh, that's awesome, man. I'm glad it hit for you. No, definitely. And I mean, I will say like the Hulk Hogan one, I feel like was more difficult and I feel like maybe didn't land as much as, not that it was bad, but I thought it was still a good yeah. episode. But like, I, I think it was more difficult to avoid yeah. some of the rehash, which maybe uh, for someone like myself knows more of. But we're, yeah. otherwise, I think- and, you know, and I get that. And, you know, what was interesting for me is that, um, you know, I hear, uh, it's so weird for me to hear like a ton of people like love different ones. Some people are like, ah, oh, the Flair one was weak. Or some people are like, oh man, I love Roman Reigns or I love Sasha Banks. And at the time, you know, we're kind of like, oh, which, you know, you kind of order which ones you thought were the best. And then to hear people's responses of it, you know, it's it, it speaks to um, just the human spirit and how everybody resonates with something different for different reasons. And I think it's really cool. Have you got many people from like like non wrestling bands to who viewed it and seen it and given their kind of two sides of like where they land? I mean, you know, to be honest with you, I try to stay out of that like as much as I can. I just try to focus on the work. I don't Fair really enough. focus on like the critics and like, all that stuff. So um, I know that it's been very very well received. I don't know who's been watching it. It could be all WWE fans, um, but you know, I, I mean, my mom likes it. But it's my mom. <laughs> so I have no yeah. idea. You know, so it's one of those things where I don't really I don't really put a ton of stock in like what other people's opinions are. Like if I'm if I'm proud of it, obviously you have to make something that people like and it feels good for somebody to be like, that was awesome. I loved it. But you also can't like do art 
and have everybody's opinion like it, people are critics and they're critics and that's what it is you know and so if i get somebody that says they hated something or if i get somebody that says they love it i'm pretty even keel like i'm kind of like ah i felt good about it and i know what it was i know the you know i know um what the assignment was i know the the um limitations that we had i also know the um the wins that we had and so i kind of can see it from a holistic view and put it in a certain bin of being like okay for what this was, I can feel good about this and these things. And so it helps me be able to kind of um, have some grounding when it comes to perspective. That's probably the healthiest approach. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah I will just go crazy if you just get on the internet and look at trolls. You know? No, 100%. 100%. Um, I will just say, just to throw out there, my two favorite episodes, uh, Randy on and, and The Miz were my two favorites. Of, uh, oh, nice. Um, yeah, I think, those are up there for me, man. Yeah, I think it's the emotional aspect of those ones because um, it really hits home. Like there is that real emotional depth because ultimately that's what connects in any form of storytelling, film, television, wrestling. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's the emotional aspect we need to feel. Um, and you really feel for Randy, like the struggles that he went through the dips and it, again and some of those like the his really down periods really hit home and even up with Miz's like him having to change in the dressing rooms and then you even yeah. you know, that recreation and showing it and then when you get to, you know when you get even when you get to that talking smack moment of the Miz and he just unleashes yeah. on Brian but you feel it you feel the sense of like almost like he did it like he got where he wanted to get to so yeah it's, it's yeah it, it's a real it hit home I think in, in, in ways that I think I think those are my two favorite I think those are two of my favorites too. You know, I like, um, I like a lot of ones for different reasons, but those two, those two interviews were really powerful. They're both very, very good. I think Randy understood the assignment so well of like doing the psychology stuff, yeah. you know, when he was, uh, getting into character, that, oh my was, God. that was really, that's awesome. You know, I mean, it's awesome. And so he understood the assignment. I, I love that. Um, and then, you know, Mike, uh, he's just great on camera, man. He's just amazing on camera. That's, he's like got a crazy gift, you know? So when you interview people like that and they have such a charismatic personality and they can draw you in, it's like all these guys can talk, but there's yeah. some people that can just draw you in um, in a different way. And he's one of those guys. They also have the two best openings, I think as well, that work perfectly for each episode. Where you, with Mike's, you've got the... You know, when he's doing the criticizing the camera shot and like, oh, you just oh, missed yeah, the show. Yeah. Like, it's just, it's just yeah, the yeah. miss. Yeah. Miss. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you're just like, oh, what an asshole. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And then obviously with yeah. Randy's, you've got that, like, when he's getting into character. That one, I mean, if you want to hook for an episode, my God, like, I mean, I don't, I don't know if you knew yeah. he was going to do that or quite like that, but what was your reaction to that? Because that was, that was, I was, I mean, I was, I was shocked there. quite in a great way. Yeah, I mean, it was it was kind of funny when it happened because uh, he was just like casually talking and then he just kind of went into it. And I mean, I'm just sitting there. I'm probably sitting, you know, three feet away from him and he's doing that and he's looking at the camera. But I mean, I'm right there. I'm right next to the camera, you know, and I think everybody after he got done just kind of paused for a minute and he just sat back. He goes, how was that? Was that weird? And we're just like, oh my God, this is amazing. You know, it's just like, you can see what a great performer he is because he makes you feel something, you know? Yeah. And that's what I think is so cool about his story is that he transformed from like this pretty boy, uh, you know, legacy guy into someone who's like a legitimate wrestler who clearly belongs and it wasn't just given it you know at a young age yeah is that also like again maybe it's even more interesting to ask someone like yourself like coming to get a guest from the outside of the wrestling bubble if you will seeing that and what he did and then knowing that he has to do that like 300 days a year as opposed to like yes. an, an actor who does it for six weeks and then it's done and he yes. has to do that like what does that kind of impact how like that's because that I when I try to tell some of the people like the commitment and what they have to do and the level they have to do it before it's just another level that's almost unparalleled to other form of entertainers 
It is. And, you know, I think what is interesting for me is seeing that side of it because I didn't really think about it, you know, as an outsider being that difficult until you think about the, not only the physicality of it, I think that was kind of easy to get my head around, but if you're the undertaker, I was talking to Mark for a while about you're playing the undertaker for 300 days a year. And he's not like that, but that would, that would wear on you after a while. And the way that he did things was like, don't really go out in public. Don't do interviews. Like he was very old school, did not break character. You know, he wasn't on late night. You know, he wasn't doing that stuff. He was like the undertaker. He was like making sure, sneaking in and out of places, you know, and doing that because he was committed to that craft and that commitment would be lonely. That commitment would be um, mentally draining. And so I think that was one of the things I gained a whole lot more respect for it, you know, through through seeing what these people do. Sasha Banks, great quote. She said, I didn't even see my real hair color for, for a year. Hmm. You know, I mean, yeah. that's, that's, that would be wild. It would yeah. be way different, you know? And just, I mean, I just, because we're on the emotional side of it as well. I will say, I don't know if anything hit, and this is, I think anyone can relate to, like the Roman Reigns episode. And I, and obviously I was watching it unfold, but I didn't really think about it to this degree until it's really highlighted in the documentary. The leukemia thing, when he comes back and then he's still booed. Like, oh, that, I mean, if that, that was doesn't... funny. That was a funny thing. That was a funny connection that I made that like even WWE didn't really um, think about. Yeah. Is I you know, and when I was talking to Evan, you know, who made like the uh, that connection as well, Evan Mack, I was like one of the things I think is crazy is that this dude in most sports arenas or any arena, it would be like, yeah, he's back. Yeah. But instead they're yeah. like, yeah, we're glad you're alive, but boo, <laughs> you know? And I was like, one, that's like hilarious dark humor from a, uh, you know, filmmaking standpoint when he yeah. does that because it's so true, you know, because it's just like, God, I cannot believe that it happened. But it, it was one of those things that I think was probably understood, but never really like brought up that I thought was really funny and kind of interesting. Yeah, no, I, honestly, because obviously I watched it on board and I was like, oh, he's, they've gone back to booing him again. But I just didn't really think much of it. But when you really highlight, you really, so again, the human side of it, like anyone can relate to that. And you're like, what the hell? Like he was going to die and he's come back and he's being booed. <laughs> he's like, I'm back. And they're like, go away. <laughs> <laughs> It's crazy, man. Yeah, and I've, I, that's, yeah. I mean, that's another thing I think you do again, like, again, coming from that outside and that, that refreshing perspective and narrative that you've got into it, that works so well. Yeah. Uh, certainly from, like I said, emotional standpoint. Um, and you talked about, like, some of the pop culture aspects and getting, getting, obviously, that side of the world in. That's obviously one of the big things of this. The interviews that you have, the range of interviews you have, uh, you know, Dr. Phil, <laughs> so obviously Snoop Dogg <laughs> is related to Sasha that's understandable yeah. and Jason Jason Bloom from like the Bloom House Productions I believe uh yeah. who's talk who, who better to talk about all the horror stuff and that even just that him talking about right. the significance of the mask and things like that like that's really really cool stuff like and again I get what makes this really different because I think again going back to other documentaries and I think WWE might be kind of at fault with this as well maybe even some of the A&E documentaries they'll get names almost like it doesn't add much but they just get names to be like hey look we've been interviewing I mean, this guy like he's listen, here like this was this was something that I was pretty bullheaded on you know when it came down to um why we were interviewing some people and because that is that it's not just WWE, it's like every network in the history of networks. Yeah, it's like, sure. wow, we need to boost the IP, you know, it's like, and in my brain, I'm like, <laughs> unless they are a character that has something to do with this, they cannot be in this. And so we just kind of kept coming back to, but why, you know, and so it's like, you mentioned Corey Taylor, 
You know, we got Corey Taylor in it because he wears a mask in Slipknot. That mm -hmm. makes sense. So let's go down a list of people who are WWE fans or who do we think fit in this timeline. You know, if somebody's got the uh, Ric Flair drip, then cool, they're qualified. But let's like go, go through this thing and not just throw, you know, Mario Lopez in there or whoever, unless they're going to say something from their personal experience or they have some personal connection or they have, they can't just be a fan, you know, because in my mind, it's like you only have so much time to give legitimacy to something. And when a random pop person pops in there, you, and if they don't say something intelligent, I would rather just have like a journalist say something that I can use rather than, you know, a Justin Bieber hopping in saying something just to have Biebs be like, yeah, I love wrestling. You're like, thanks a lot for the contribution, Biebs. You know, you know? And so you just kind of want to, as a filmmaker, make sure that everybody fits and they're giving something meaningful. Now, you know, I, I've heard, you know, Dr. Phil was a, was a little bit of a struggle for me to uh, figure out how that would optically look to have Dr. Phil, you know, pop in. But what I will say about it is we wanted a psychologist. We wanted somebody that you know, could come in and give a deeper meaning to what could be happening. And even though I was on the fence with him, because I thought that as soon as you saw it, you were going to be like Dr. Phil. And there's a certain brand that Dr. Phil has. Yeah. What Dr. Phil actually said kind of blew me away because I was kind of like, whoa, Dr. Phil's actually, not that I didn't think he was good on camera, yeah. but what he's actually saying helps the show. Now, if you can get over the fact that it's Dr. Phil, that's kind of like for own people to figure out. But when we got back and started putting it together, I'm like, what he's saying, if I'm not, you know, if I'm letting down all of my personal feelings on what, how a person like Dr. Phil fits in the evil series, what he says is actually pretty dang good, you yeah. know? And so, uh, you know, I was happy about that. And so that was enough reason for me to be like, this makes sense. Sounds good. No, I mean, I agree with that. And to be fair, I will say Dr. Phil was probably the one that I was a bit like, oh, Dr. Phil? <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, I mean, we had the same, I had the same conversation about um, about uh, Mario Lopez, you know, th that we were interviewing him. And I, you know, I made a joke when I was interviewing him. I was like, okay, so you were the original, I know you haven't experienced, you know, being evil because you were the original bully of Bayside High. <laughs> um, and so we, we kind of made that joke and he's like, ah, ha, ha. and so then, you know, making him say, I remember when I was a kid and Hulk Hogan was this, that yeah. kind of was enough for me to be like, okay, he's not totally random. He's given a fan perspective in some type of way, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I thought actually Mario really added to like that understanding how deep that connection was and how important Hulk Hogan was. Cause obviously when you ultimately get to the betrayal, you understand how much that impacted people. Cause you're like, how, like, right. I don't know if that connection really exists anymore because of the world we live in. But well, that that what people right. had with Hulk, and I, I had it later. But I kind of when I grew up because Rock and Austin were the guys. But I grew up watching the old tapes of Hogan, so I kind of had that connection as well. Yeah. So I kind of understand it, but I wasn't obviously at the time when Hulk was at the top. But it's yeah, it's, it's a yeah. rare thing. I don't, which I think people don't maybe quite don't understand because I don't know if that connection really exists anymore. Right. Yeah, it's, it's wild to watch some of that archival footage and be like, whoa. It's kind of like when you watch archival footage of Michael Jackson and people are like fainting. Yeah. And like all of this stuff. And you're like, what? You know, there's some, I don't I don't get it. You know, but that's just, there was a level of stardom that, you know, the Beatlemania, all of that stuff that just isn't quite, I guess you've seen it a couple different times, maybe from like middle schoolers with NSYNC or Justin Bieber or whatever, but maybe. to those degrees... Maybe. Yeah, Conor McGregor, maybe, if you're talking UFC. Yeah, maybe. Like, for an adult, you know, Conor McGregor, I, I'd say he was pretty polarizing and pretty big, yeah. you know, for sure. Yeah, no, no, I mean, they're definitely, I, 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 they, the way you filtered it down, I think, yeah, it's, it was good because, uh, like I said, we and like you know, uh, there is those that are, they're there for show, but not with much more substance. So, uh, kudos right. to you on that. Kudos right. to you on, like, um, where well, we laid it then. down. Yeah. Um, just going back to um, like, uh, but one of those things that I said, like that, that, the, that those, those interviews do, and obviously all the kind of context of like the time periods and the movies, et cetera, 
it, it makes it more accessible, like you said, to to the wider audience, uh, which I love because I, I think one of the things I've consistently written about, asked people like yourselves, is wrestling's historically always had this, it's it's kind of looked down upon. It's it's the gross stepchild of Hollywood and theatre. Uh, and it's always, yeah, it's, there's a lot of disrespect to wrestling. And I think now that's, it's definitely changed and that's evolved um, over time, especially with people like Cena and Rock being in such prominent positions in Hollywood. Um, and I also think a series like this, where I'm picking the depth of which these characters have to go to, to actually perform at such a high level, I think also does it as well. Right. Um, but coming from your perspective and like now your experience within Evil, how, where do you feel like it is now like wrestling's acceptance in the mainstream or how people perceive it like what do you what do you and even maybe from yourself as well like where, where does that stand now do you think yeah you know i mean obviously uh, i can't speak for like uh, millions of fans you know around the country but i can speak from my own perspective my own perspective has changed a lot um one i think that i would say that going into this i was a little i wouldn't say it was from a um disrespectful uh, mindset, but I think I did think of it like, okay, a lot of middle schoolers probably watch this and that's kind of the way that, you know, I look at it. And, and I didn't really under, fully understand what the art form was. I understood that what I liked about it was that you know, huge athletic people doing stunts. That's what I like, you know, resonated with me, you know, is that I was like, whoa, I can appreciate that. That's really hard on your, your body. I didn't really get into the storylines. I didn't really get into all of the um, theatrical elements of it. Yeah. Just I just liked watching like Ray Mysterio, you know, or Goldberg or whoever like do their stuff. I was like, this is freaking impressive that you could fall off the top of a cage and do that. I appreciated that. But I think coming away from it, especially the element of the art form of how these things work where they are listening to the crowd and the struggle between staying a baby face or turning heel and playing your role and having to entertain the crowd in real time. I felt like that is like, gave me a whole new appreciation for the art form. And I just never understood how it worked. And I never understood that that was like an actual thing that they did, you know? And so playing off of that and knowing your characters so well and playing to the, to the, to the crowd, that is like, in some ways, this is a melting pot of the, the greatest art form in the world because you have connection with modern pop culture, the times, music, movies, all of these things in this brutal ballet put into um, the wrestling ring and they are trying to figure it out and entertain you while maintaining the character that they've built in a certain type of way and there's something beautiful in that and so yeah. I would say that you know when I when I look at it from that perspective you know uh, it's like whoa that's amazing and I get why people are so committed to it and are such big fans of it because it's entertainment from all angles put in one place. And so uh, I, I could say I became a fan over the course of doing this and um, any kind of cynical thoughts that I had or any misconceptions or whatever were kind of broken down once I understood the world more. And hopefully this series will do the same for other people that are coming in and trying to um, see what this thing is about. Yeah, no, I think you, it's I, I, I fascinating to hear. And I, and I always, I, like I guess I always love to hear that side of it from, especially from someone who hasn't, well, who wasn't a fan, because I think it's more interesting. Because um, it's easy when you are a fan to be invested and understand it. So that's really cool to hear. And I, and I think this series definitely can, because I, I think the nuances it goes into and the connections it makes, it's, it's, uh, it's really well done and people can relate to it for sure. Um, and I, I told you my favourite moment in the series there with, with the Randy's uh, psychotic opening. Um, what was, did you have a favorite moment? Like whether it was interviewing Hogan and I miss going back to your childhood or just something that struck you that maybe was particularly fun to, or a fun memory for you. Oh man. Um, I think one of my favorite moments, and this is such a random one is kind of the Vince Russo and Eric Bischoff back and forth. It's, just because it's just like 
I just couldn't believe, you know, I love the part where he says, uh, you know, don't edit that out. I dare you. <laughs> I, I, that just to me was just so authentic and real. I felt like that was one of my favorite parts uh, that I'm glad that we were able to kind of keep in um, because I think that you're getting some real emotion. I, I love in Miz, uh, you know, when he, when he loses it, that moment that you mentioned where he really breaks down. Um, and I love the build up to that. I think that's super powerful, man, hmm. because it's authentic. It's real. It's heartbreaking in a lot of ways. And I think those two moments are, um, that's what you want, you know, because you want something, you know, you, you get into these cycles where people have done so many interviews that um, they tell the same stories over and over. They say it the same way over and over and, you know, you kind of are like, all right, yeah, I get it. I get it. I get it. And so anytime you get a moment where you're like, that was just for me, you're like, that's where we got it, man. And so those are some moments, I think, when we were talking about those things that we were able to pull out some stuff that I was like, that was just for us. I, that, I mean, that's, that's cool. I actually forgot about the Bishop bit, actually. That was actually, that was very cool. <laughs> um, was there a particular, would you, could you, they all down, who was your favorite person to interview? Let's say, let's say from the, I, from the wrestlers, so we say. Yeah, I mean, I like uh, Mark Calloway was really fun because I just, uh, you know, I'd watched him for so long and I felt like when I was talking to him, he just, uh, he, it was like he had this secret for years that he had been wanting to say. And then he was finally able to like talk about it. And I think that that was really cool. I also felt like I had a great time interviewing Hulk. He was just, he was just super down to earth. And, um, you know, obviously he was a person that he's such a legend hmm. that, um, you know, being able to like follow up with questions and have him kind of be like, uh, ah, you could tell if you, if, if, you could see him kind of debating if you really wanted to go there or not, you know, being able to ask him specifically about creative control and to kind of navigate that stuff and see how he thought about it. Um, I thought it was fun, but you know, everybody's, everybody was super cool and they're all different in a lot of different ways, but I'd say the undertaker was uh, the coolest for me because of the secret element to it. Yeah. I can imagine that. He seems like a really cool guy as well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And uh, just my last question, and you've kind of answered this already, but can are we are we gonna see a season two? Are we gonna see or or even if not a season two, but are we gonna see more another wrestling related project from you? You know, I'm not sure. I know that it's done really well. Um, I right. know that uh, you know, John has a uh, desire to do numerous seasons, and so I'm sure that you know if they do it, uh, that he will. Uh, I would assume that they would probably do something. I'm not sure. I'm not on the network side of like those negotiations or all that stuff. And I don't even know, you know, this, this kind of thing is, you know, everybody's schedules have to align. Who knows if I'll even be involved in the other ones, you know, just because of other things I got going on. Um, but uh, I hope they do. I think there's a lot more stories to tell. I think that there's a, there's definitely room for the good side of, of this series too. Mm -hmm. And I think that I've heard, you know, in other interviews that John's expressed um, the desire to do something like that. And, and um, hopefully they do, man, because I think this will just continue to um, bring people uh, into the WWE universe that, you know, haven't been. And I think whenever you have a chance to introduce people to something that is really special, I think that it's a unifying thing and, and hopefully, uh, you know, they will. Yeah, hopefully. And uh, I, I would definitely hope that you're a part of it as well, because you've done a hell of a job. <laughs> Oh, thanks, man. I really appreciate that. And this may be too good of me to ask, but um, how, like, as far as you said, you know, it's done really well. Like, have they told you numbers or like, like viewerships and kind of thing? They don't really uh, go there with me. I'm sure they have, like, with you know, Buna Murray or uh, WWE certainly knows what that yeah. stuff is. I know that the streaming platforms keep things pretty tight to the chest. Yeah, but I do know that uh, you know, whenever they did the Roman Reigns episode on USA, they released that, and I think there's like 600 and some thousand people that watched it. Oh, wow. which is more than their rival um, competitors, um, you know, promotion made that night, and yeah. it was at like 11 p.m. So that's uh, that's impressive. You know yeah. that they didn't promote it at all, and 
they got 600 and some thousand. Those are huge numbers, yeah. you know, to be able to do. And, um, you know, what I've heard is that it's done very well. Is uh, There's been uh, a significant amount of uh, traffic driven to Peacock because of it. Ah, amazing. And a well-deserved. And I must say, with the Roman episode, whether you did it intentionally or not, that little caveat of uh, the rock tease has, like, literally spread around like wildfire. <laughs> Everyone's talking about that. Right. Yeah. I can't say if it was intentional or not, but I will say it, uh, it was clever. It, there. it was clever. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I mean, honestly, uh, thank you so much for this, Mickey. So it was, uh, like I said, I'm always fascinated. I love, I love diving into this stuff, as you can tell with potentially some of my very yeah, in-depth questions. Perhaps I don't know, <laughs> um, but uh, oh, you know, I love. Yeah, no, so it's always great. And it's, I know your answers have been great to hear and how you've unpicked this. And um, and I'm really just, I'm really happy with how you've, uh, how it's all come out and how you've done it. And uh, I just really respect the work and your approach to it as well. So it's just fascinating to hear. I appreciate that, man. And yeah, anytime, you know, if I got something you want to talk about, let me know. 